Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Juan Carlos Brando. Today, uh, we are broadcasting from a very special place in the city of Atlanta. Um, we're connecting to the office in Cleveland, Ohio. So thank you so much for having us today. Thank you so much uh, for joining uh, this show with one of the attorneys in the law firm of Margaret W. Wong and Associates, which is the attorney, Noor Chanas, one of the experts in the immigration field. How are you doing today, attorney? Doing well. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, attorney. And well, um, we're seeing a lot of changes uh, coming in immigration every single day. But now uh, people are talking a lot about anti or anti-immigrant laws that are being set in several states of the United States of America. So um, what is true and what is not true about these laws, especially in Florida, Georgia, and Texas? Um, well, they, there are states like those states that you just mentioned that are passing laws that are considered anti-immigrant laws. What they are essentially is that they give authority to state law enforcement officials to arrest people who are unlawfully in the United States if they are in those states and also to prosecute people who are deemed to assist and abet people who are here illegally. Um, the, for right now, uh, there was a recent Supreme Court decision as to whether or not the, uh, the, the Texas law can still be go into effect while they're waiting for the federal courts to make decisions on whether or not it, it is constitutional. The federal government, I mean, uh, the administration is arguing that the states have no power to enforce um, immigration law, have no authority to do that. And so there's still lawsuits going on right now to determine whether or not uh, that will hold true in the appellate courts. Um, if a decision is made that the constitutionally that the states do not have any authority to enforce immigration laws, and obviously those those laws uh, would no longer be in effect. But as of right now, these states are implementing those laws. And I know um, a lot of the undocumented people are feeling insecure in those states because they're afraid that you know at any point somebody might arrest them. Um, so, uh, should people be scared about immigration that they are going to knock at your door and pick you up and take you and get you arrested or it's not the same situation as it was four or five years ago? No, no, that's not happening right now. Um, even for four or five years ago, it wasn't really happening that way. The people, they don't just show up to your door and arrest you for the most part in, in ca cases where people are detained is somebody gets either pulled over or arrested for a non-immigration related issue, usually either a traffic violation or some criminal conduct. And uh, after they are arrested, <clears throat> the, uh, their information is sent over to the Department of Homeland Security. And if they're determined to have no documents, then the Department of Homeland Security and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, they put a detainer or a hold on that person. And then they're given 48 hours to go pick that person up uh, this still could happen today. It was ha obviously with the current administration, it was happening a lot less frequently than it did under the Trump administration. Um, but essentially just for people to, to not worry about it, there really is not any cases of ICE agents coming to your home and knocking on your door. Um, they, they may do that in very, very limited uh, cases, uh, but not for the most part. So what, uh, what difference do you have if I don't have any documents and they get pulled over for, uh, by a police officer and then uh, they have this program? In the past, it was the 287G, uh, but right now, we don't know what's, uh, I mean, there are other programs that are getting set up mm -hmm. in some states, uh, but what is my defense? How can I defend myself? so that they don't uh, deport me after getting me on call of immigration? Well, they can't deport you. Uh, just generally speaking, the only time they can deport someone is if they already have an order of deportation that um, you know has not been enforced. But if, you're, if you have no documents, let's say the police pulls you over for a traffic violation, and then they see that you have no documents, so they contact ICE, and then ICE comes and picks you up. Essentially, um, 
you uh, have the same defense as you always do in immigration court. They have to put you through immigration court proceedings because that's uh, part of your due process. Uh, you, they cannot deport you without giving you the opportunity to go before an immigration judge. Now, one thing I do warn people, because we have seen this in the past, is a lot of times uh, these um, ICE officers will try to uh, convince or pressure uh, detained people to sign documents. Sometimes they don't know what they're signing. Essentially, what they're trying to get them to sign a lot of times is something called a stipulated removal order, which means that you agree to get a final removal order and to be deported without having without exercising your right to go before an immigration judge. So uh, my advice always is whenever ICE agents are asking you to sign anything, I highly advise that you don't sign, that you contact an attorney for the attorney to review whatever documents they're attempting to get you to sign and always insist that you want to exercise your right to go before an immigration judge. But once you get before an immigration judge, then at that point, you can request uh, various forms of relief from the court, depending on what you qualify for. Okay, thank you very much, Attorney Noor. And don't forget that everybody can join us and ask your questions, uh, your questions absolutely free and um, live with the attorney. And today, um, you can also call the phone number 216 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984. Uh, we have a first question today coming in. It says, good morning. How long is I-130 valid once approved? Does it expire? Okay, that depends. So if the I-130 was approved uh, on the basis that you will file for adjustment of status inside the United States, it will not expire. Uh, normally, that I, the I-130 approval could essentially go on forever. However, if the I-130 is uh, designated as one where you will be seeking consular processing abroad, that I-130 is forwarded to the National Visa Center. At that point, the National Visa Center will uh, start or commence your visa processing. And so you're required to continue to maintain contact with NVC during that period. If you fail to maintain contact with the National Visa Center for a period of a year, you're normally sent a letter. It's sort of like a warning, and it's telling you that your case is going to be uh, terminated with NVC if you don't respond and explain why you haven't uh, why you haven't maintained contact. And then if that goes on for another year, so if you haven't maintained contact for two years, they will normally just send you a letter telling you your case has been terminated and your file has been destroyed. And what that means is that the I-130 is no longer valid. So if you want, if you wanted to restart your processing, you would have to go back and file a new I-130. But like I said before, if the I-130 is for the purpose of adjusting status in the US, it will not expire. Okay, thank you very much, Attorney Noor. And don't forget that the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. Or, uh, we have another question coming in and it says, uh, does this apply for people who overstayed their ESTA visa, uh, a pen by eyes, can they deport you then? Yeah, so if you have a, what's called a visa waiver program, um, so normally they can deport you uh, without seeing an immigration judge if you're on a visa waiver program because uh, there is uh, an agreement to be on the visa waiver program that you know you will not overstay and if you do that you're subject to removal immediately however the only time that they would not be able to deport you is if you uh, claim that you have a fear of returning to your country and then if you request uh, to have an asylum case be heard then they're required to allow you to do that and then you can go before an immigration judge but those would be what are called asylum only proceedings what they what their what the purpose is is that the immigration judge will only review whether or not you should be granted asylum um, and if not then the case is over and then, then they can deport you so that, that there is that exception for people under the visa waiver program okay thank you very much attorney noor don't forget 
Uh, the attorney Margaret W. Wong has offices in seven cities of the United States. One of them is the city of Atlanta. So what you are seeing behind me is not a banner, is not a poster, is the Trust Park in the city of Atlanta. It's the baseball park where the uh, Braves play. But uh, I'm sure the attorney Noor, he supports the Cleveland Guardians. Uh, <laughs> so he I'm likes progressive field. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> I'm actually not from Cleveland originally, so I actually support all all Bay Area California teams. Oh, okay. But, well, well, that's but I'm not a big I'm not a big baseball fan, so it's fine. <laughs> okay, that's that's okay. Okay, perfect. So um, let's go ahead with the next question. The next question says, um, "I entered one and a half years ago. I filed asylum, and I have a court next year." What happens in that court? Should I go or not? I am from India. I'm sorry, I didn't get the last part. They're from where? Uh, from India. The person is from India. Well, if you're in removal proceedings and you have a court hearing, if you don't show up to that court hearing, you will be order removed in your absence. Um, you know, unless you have a really good reason for why you didn't appear in court. Now, normally what will happen is if you don't show up, to your court hearing, the the judge will proceed in absentia in your absence and could order you removed in your absence. If you do have a good reason, meaning exceptional or extraordinary circumstances as to why you were not able to attend your court hearing, you would then need to file a motion to reopen your case with the court. Um, and if the court is convinced that you did have a good reason, then they will they would reopen your case. I don't recommend that you don't show up to your court hearing unless you just want to go back to India and you don't want to pursue your asylum application, at which point my recommendation would be to either request voluntary departure or in some cases to if if you're found, uh, you know, to have been inadmissible, then you could withdraw your application for admission to the U.S and you will be allowed to leave voluntarily. So you will not actually uh, get a removal order. But um, I don't recommend definitely that you just leave the country if you have a pending immigration court case because you will be ordered removed. Or I'm sorry, I don't recommend that you don't show up to your court hearing because you will be ordered removed in your absence and then you will have a deportation order on your record. Okay, that's important that we know all of that because um, if we don't know what's going on in immigration, we're going to get in trouble. And you don't want to get in trouble with immigration because it's a major situation. Um, hi, I filed for TPS and I have an asylum pending, but couldn't get uh, my work permit for some reason. I don't know what happened. Um, what can I do to get a new work permit? Well, normally, if you file an application for asylum, and, and I'm not sure... Uh, about the facts of your specific case, but let's say you file an application for asylum and you qualify for asylum, you have to, you are not allowed to file an application for a work permit until at least 150 days have elapsed since the time that you filed your application. And you would only be able to obtain a work permit until uh, when 180 days have already elapsed since you filed that application. So essentially you're gonna have, you're gonna wait six months before you can get a work permit. Now, I'm not sure about your specific case. However, if generally speaking to qualify for asylum, you have to file your application within one year of entering the United States. If you don't file within one year, then you will not be deemed to be eligible for asylum. However, you could still be eligible for something, another form of protection called withholding of removal, which doesn't have the same benefits as asylum. Uh, however, there are exceptions. There are some exceptions to the one-year filing requirement. If you fall under one of those exceptions, you could still qualify for asylum. Now, one of the issues is that many courts, they will, if you don't qualify for asylum, let's say you file your application and it's, and it's well beyond a year, the court will code the uh, application as withholding only and not asylum. And if they do that, then there will be no clock in your case and you will not be eligible to file for a work permit while your case is pending. So I, I don't know if that's the case in, your, in with what happened to you specifically. I don't know the facts of your case, 
but there's you know a multiplicity of reasons why your um, asylum I mean your work permit application could have been denied and I would urge you to call an attorney and you can call our offices <clears throat> to get advice in that regard and we can explain it to you better okay thank you very much attorney Noor and we're getting a lot of questions and thank you so much for joining us everybody that uh, um, are coming into this show <clears throat> Don't forget that the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984, and you can talk to the attorneys in the law firm of Margaret W. Wong and Associates. Today, we're talking with one of the experts, attorney Noor Chamas, who is one of the experts in uh, cancellation of removal, asylum cases. So if you have questions about this uh, kind of cases, today is the day. So... The phone number, don't forget, 216-279-3984. Uh, what is the wait time for asylum office for interview? Um, depends on the asylum office. The different asylum offices have different wait times, but it's several years at this point before you'll get an interview. Um, supposedly they've been shortening it, but I, you know, at recent, with the recent filings, I'm not sure exactly because with the recent filings, we haven't, I guess, yet received an interview, so we don't know. But before that, it was taking three to four years before you would actually get an interview. Um, and then there was a time period where they were able to shorten it and they were they were actually giving interviews within two months of filing an application, but that has, that has stopped now. So they've gone back to a, a more lengthy period. Um, I can't say for sure, but based on the previous uh, time uh, waiting times, I'm assuming it's gonna be several years before you'll get an interview. Okay, thank you very much, Attorney Noor. Don't forget the phone number is 216-279-3984. We have a lot of activity today here in the stadium. And, but yeah, this is the United States of America, and we have a lot of sports that are played in this uh, country. Uh, so something interesting that is going on right now in the sports is a Japanese baseball player has been discovered in like, uh, gambling or something. It's under investigation, but uh, what happens if a person that has a special visa, like an old visa, uh, gets in trouble? Uh, would they be deported or for a person that is earning $70 million a year, what would be a, a sanction for them? They could be. It depends on what exactly they were uh, well, first of all, they would have to be convicted of something. Um, also, if there was a violation of uh, their specific visa requirements, then they could have that visa revoked. Um, you know, with the case of sports, obviously, it becomes much more complicated because it's a multi-billion dollar industry. So they don't like to just, you know, revoke visas and, and, and deport people that they're paying millions of dollars per year. However, generally speaking, just like with anything, if you're, if you're in the U.S. on a visa, if you violate the law, if you're convicted of any crime, then you could be deported depending on what that specific uh, violation or crime is that you committed. Um, you could be found to be deportable under uh, the Immigration and Nationality Act uh, based on specific uh, crimes that you may have committed. Um, I don't know specifically what this would fall under. However, um, anything related to fraud involving a large amount of money could be deemed to be an aggravated felony. If it is deemed to be an aggravated felony, then you will be deportable under immigration law in the U.S. And you could very well be deported. You would, just like anything else, like just like I said before, you would have to go before an immigration judge um, to see if you have any defense to your deportation. But essentially, you could be put in deportation proceedings. I don't see that happening with a baseball player that's being paid, paid millions of dollars, but Generally speaking, with the rest of you that are watching the show, I would caution that you could become affordable. If, if it was, <laughs> if it was JC Brando, it would be different. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. We have another question coming in. Uh, this question says, "Good afternoon. I came and filed asylum. My partner came three months later and wants to file asylum, but it's a lot of money. If we get ma uh, legally married." Can I add her to my asylum case and probably get a work permit for her? So if you 
filed your asylum application affirmatively, meaning that you filed it with USCIS, with the Immigration Service, and you're not in immigration court proceedings, then if you get married, yes, you can add that person to your asylum application. They can be derivatives on your application. If you are in immigration court proceedings and your spouse, and you know, your partner now, but your spouse to be is not in immigration court proceedings, you cannot add them. What you can do is if your asylum is granted, then you can file a form I-730, which is like a follow to join, which then allows your spouse to uh, obtain asylum status based on your uh, approval of your applica uh, asylum application. Okay, thank you very much, Attorney Noor. And what we have um, more questions coming in. One of them is from a person that is uh, from Bangladesh, and this person says, um, I work in a I work in a Dunkin. I don't have uh, just a work permit, but we got robbed in the store. Um, and this uh, the the situation is that these people pointed at us with guns, and they robbed the store. So my question is, if I could get a benefit because we were robbed in the store, it's all recorded in cameras, and I am from Bangladesh, I'm a young lady that came five years ago. Okay, so there is a type of visa that is available for people who are victims of certain qualifying criminal activities. That means if you are a victim of one of those crimes and you establish that uh, you cooperated and gave information to the police to help the police either apprehend or prosecute the uh, the perpetrator of the crime, then you could be eligible for this type of visa. It's called a U visa. Um, now, as I said, there are specific crimes that qualify under this type of visa. Normally, robbery is not actually one of those crimes. However, it does allow you uh, to claim that you qualify for a crime that is similar to one of the ones that are listed. One of the crimes listed, for example, is felonious assault. And even though you were not, you know, specifically uh, physically harmed from, from my understanding, you could potentially still claim that it was felonious assault when somebody pointed a gun at you because they um, basically threatened your life with the gun. However, um, you know, it's something that you would want to hire an attorney and have an attorney look over the police report and look over the actual crime that occurred. Um, again, we do, we do a lot of these U visas here. So if you want to call our office, we'd be more than happy to work with you on it. Um, but generally speaking, um, you are eligible for this type of visa if you are a victim of a qualifying criminal activity. Okay, thank you very much, Attorney Noor. Um, well, um, I need to dismiss right now because uh, I have some people right behind me that need the space. I apologize for this uh, two minutes, Attorney Noor. Uh, but thank you so much for having us today. Thank you so much for your uh, sharing all of the knowledge that you have. And for everybody who has joined us today, don't forget that you can call the phone number 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. Thank you so much, Attorney Noor. Thank you for having me. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. Don't forget, the phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984, attorneys in the law offices of Margaret W. Wong Associates. Thank you so much. And see you next time.